Thank you for joining Wars of the Rosies and this video is I Am That I Am by Frater David Manners, an article taken from Rosicrucian Digest, Volume 11, Number 6, July 1933. I Am That I Am, a well-known cinema actor contributes this story by Frater David Manners. I am standing on a drenched runway in front of a row of poor cottages. The muddy, flowerless front gardens are surrounded with broken railings. It is a dark morning. It has been raining all night. I have come here because someone called me. A voice I have wanted to hear for a long time. The front door of one of the houses opens and a young man walks slowly towards me. His head is drooping. His tawny hair is tousled and damp. His limbs move slowly as if their weight was too great to bear. He comes through the useless gate and stands beside me, coatless in the cold dawn. I know the man has great physical strength, but now the muscles are limp and powerless. He leans for support against the waterlogged gate post. His gaze is sightless and turned towards the ground. He begins to speak. Why have I been singled out to be dealt such misery? I slave in stinking dark shafts to provide a penance for the two I love. First they take away my wife with a sickness of the lungs, and now they have taken my child the same way. I, who have less than most men, suffer even that to be taken from me. I am alone and I will not go down into the black hell for the privilege of living. Death is a sweet solution to this misery. As he stands there, men begin coming out of the other houses with their lunch pails under their arms. Wan faces of women and children peer from their doorways and windows. As the men pass where he stands, they speak blunt words of consolation. They say, hard luck, and better come to work it will be worse sitting idle. And he raises his swollen eyelids and laughs harshly at them. Work for what? And they leave him standing there in the road. At last, he turns and goes slowly into the house. I follow, but he does not seem to be aware of my presence. He turns out the yellow gas light in the room where the child's body lays. He stands beside the cot looking down on the peaceful little white face. Tears form again in the young father's eyes. Then he looks up at me for the first time. Why, why, he says, if this situation which you now look on as an unjust and unbearable tragedy has at least caused you to think, to question, then I can only look upon what has taken place as a benefit of divine bestowal. Utter anguish shows in his face. How can you say that? Because, in my eyes, I see what has taken place as one who is detached from the personal and physical significance of what has come to pass. To me, birth, life, and death are the same and one. Death holds no tragedy. Millions are born, millions die. What does it matter which particular body is drawing breath and which is not? The supply is limitless. Transition is inevitable. The vibration of life that infuses the cells of this child's body cannot be destroyed. It has departed, returned to the source, even as a drop of water evaporated from the oceans joins the clouds and becomes rain to swell the rivers that return again to the ocean. I cannot help but grieve over my desolation. There is a limit to my endurance. Yet your grief is as nothing compared with the grief I hold for your blindness. Grieve rather that you are open to grieve and that there are limits to your endurance. Pity that you must form attachments for the transitory and unstable. Grief that you cannot open your heart to me, your only true, lasting friend and help. Weep because in denying me, 
you have denied understanding of the ones you thought you loved and who have passed on. That you have denied the very understanding of life itself. All these years I have waited patiently for some sign of recognition from you. Some word of affection and trust. I have stood ready with knowledge and wisdom to hand to you that would have enabled you to rise yourself from the material existence which you abhor, that would have enabled you to provide the health, protection, and goods for those whose happiness you hold dear. How could you do for them what you could not do for yourself? But not one time have you asked me for the enlightenment I was so anxious to give you. Not until this, which you call an unjust persecution, have you ever even raised your eyes to meet mine or question my presence. But your indifference has never dulled my love for you. I have guarded you from physical dangers, kept your body strong and full of beauty. I have watched over you with unceasing vigilance. Even now, while you stand here bemoaning your fate, the shift of men you would have been with had you gone to the mine as usual this morning is wiped out by an explosion of gases. Those who were not killed outright will lose their mortal bodies through suffocation before aid can reach them. You have been spared because I love you. I cannot see you leaving this plane without having known me a little. He stands there motionless for several minutes staring at me with fear and doubt in his eyes. From outside come the cries of women and children mingled with the mournful wail of a siren. Realization of what has occurred comes upon him. A light returns to his dulled eyes. He comes a step closer to me, regarding me fully at last. There has been an accident at the mine. How did you know? I know all things. My sight and understanding is without limit. Walls, distances, space itself is as nothing to my perception. There is not a particle of your life in thought or action since the day when you took your first breath that I do not know. Nothing is hidden from me. If you would only hearken, let me guide you, teach you. There would be no heights on this earthly plane which you could not scale. I can open your eyes to beauty, ecstasy, and wonder. That is now beyond your comprehension. I will teach you to know and love me. For without the love of me, you can love no man. How can I know that all you say is true? You believed when I told you of the disaster at the mine because you had proof. If you had doubted, would that have altered the truth? I say to you, if you trust me, you shall know. Again, he turns his gaze searches deeply and whispers, Who are you? I am Ion, the atom, the molecule. I am the elements of earth, sea and sky. I am the storm and the life given sun. I am the seething life of the jungle and the silent space between the stars. I am father, mother, lover, friend. I am instinct and nature, great and small. I am truth, beauty and wisdom. I am all things that you can think of in your mortal mind and more than these. But do not tremble, fear not. Though I am the essence of all things, I am also simple, all forgiving, and of infinite understanding. I am, as I said before, your closest and most loving friend, one who can never perish or desert you. And now that you see me, I implore you to recognize me that I may take you unto myself in this, your hour of need. O oh, Master, tell me your name. Come, rise from your knees, gaze deep into my eyes. You are God. I am the you, your real self. And suddenly his tension breaks and a great peace comes upon him. He takes me firmly by the hand and I lead him out of the house, up the hill, out of the dark town of sorrow. The clouds break, letting the warm sun envelope his body. The wind blows clean and fresh. His stride is that of a free man and his face is radiant like the face of an angel.
Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.